My name is Evananda. I've been teaching yoga around the world for over 30 years, sharing my blessings by offering free yoga classes. Currently on the most beautiful beach in America, here in Siesta Key, Florida. Furthering my collaboration. My name is Evananda, and welcome to Beyond the Matrix a show that explores the mysteries of life and empowers you with knowledge concerning your world and your being. SBNvideo.tv is your free thinking zone and the place to go for all things spiritual. Feng Shui is an ancient Chinese art whose name translates from Chinese as wind and water. Feng Shui is a lyrical phrase that poetically evokes the heart of this ancient practice. Wind and water, first and foremost, are natural elements. In ancient thought, they are two of the five elements that comprise all of nature. Wind is the earth's breath, and water is the invigorating lifeblood of everything that exists on our planet. Both wind and water have tremendous energy that drives feng shui practices and techniques to fill your life with positive energies. Feng shui, at its very core, is a means of arranging the basic elements of life and all things that you surround yourself with on a daily basis to create the optimal and harmonious flow of vital energy, just like the flow of water and wind. To help us understand feng shui more deeply, we are pleased to welcome to the SBN studio, Kathy Key, K, K. I couldn't remember, I'm sorry. Because oh, no it says uh, K-E-H, <laughs> yes. Kathy K. Uh, welcome to the studio. Thank you. Uh, she is the owner of Feng Shui Sarasota here in Sarasota. And before I begin my questions, I again read your biography and I found it very, very interesting. And I thought it would be very nice if you um, gave us a little bit about your background and how you came into the business of Feng Shui. Okay. So if you tell us a little about your education and uh, how it happened. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's not that exciting. I was. Well, um, it is to an outside. <laughs> Our kidding. life is never exciting to yeah, us, yeah, is it? Yeah. Well, I was um, an English lit major undergrad, mm -hmm. so very different from where I uh -huh. am now. And I spent 20 years in corporate America. I spent 10 years doing sales and business development in, with high tech companies like Adobe Systems and Microsoft, and had great experiences there and then I shifted a little bit and I spent the next 10 years in nonprofit fundraising mm -hmm. where I worked with a lot of different nonprofits um, in terms of getting them ready to raise a lot of money for their capital campaigns and then helping them to really look at how successful their programs are doing and so also Did very you get to travel a lot? I did, yes. I did, oh. I got to travel a where lot. Did, where have you been? I traveled a lot to Asia, Asia. for work which ah. I've considered always such a privilege to mm -hmm. go see all these different countries and be with different people and is that really where you got your it. first exposure to feng shui um no believe no. it or not no. the exposure i got to feng shui was a book written by an american woman named karen roush carter all right and she wrote a book called move your stuff change your life and oh. this was my Bible for about 15 years. And every home I ever lived in, the first thing I would do was pull out that book, <laughs> feng shui my house, I'd measure everything out, put the tape down, divide yes. it into the nine squares. And it was always so much fun for me. And I always felt like, wow, you know, if I can take the initiative to help my life go well and go smoothly. I'm going to do it. I'm going to mm -hmm. do whatever I can to line those things up. And so I've enjoyed it for many, many years as a hobby. As a hobby. As a hobby. And um, so anyway, after I moved to Sarasota, I guess I'd been living here for about four years or so, and I had been working for a software company, and I got laid off. And so You and everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I got laid Four off. Four years and ago, particularly, yes. Yes. And um, our company was, you know, being very tightly squozen, and so I got laid off. Uh -huh. And I had interviewed with a lot of other mm -hmm. software companies and I had every plan to go back in to the yes. same career that I was working in. And um, I did while I was waiting to hear back from prospective new employers. Prospects, I, yes. yes. I decided to re-feng shui the house that I was living in and, you know, just kind of clean things out. And mm -hmm. it's it was an amazing experience because as I started clearing things out, I ha I'm very neat, but I have one closet in my house where there's file boxes from every year of my life for oh. the past 20 years. So all the clutter you can find yes. in one closet. Yes, and all filed well, in organization. Yes. But um, I said to myself, you know, why am I keeping all these things from decades ago, from banks with canceled checks where the banks don't <laughs> exist anymore, <laughs> and just crazy things. So I decided to clear all that out, and I couldn't believe how much stuff came out of that organized closet. Oh. And um, so I was doing that, and in the process, I was like, let me look at the feng shui again of my house. There's a few things that haven't gone that smoothly. Let me see what I can tweak. Mm -hmm. So in the process of doing that, I just got so inspired to ha I, all these ideas started flowing into my life in a very creative way about opening feng shui sarasota mm -hmm. and i like to tell my students and my clients about that experience because it's a very good example of how when you let certain even though clutter and decluttering is not a traditional feng shui thing there was no such thing as clutter five thousand years ago but the <laughs> it's act a totally modern phenomenon yes but. yes but the act of letting things go really does open up room in your psyche and your consciousness mm, for that. new things to come in. And, um, and then just having to look at my feng shui again, I went on the internet, I found Lillian Tu's website. Lillian Tu's a very famous feng shui grandmaster out in Malaysia. Oh, she, she is. What is her name again? Lillian, Repeat it. Lillian Tu. T-O-O. T-O-O? Yes. Really? Yes. Okay. Well. And she started out very traditional and mainstream as a banker. She was one of the first women to be president of a bank in Malaysia and very fascinating. Anyway, she offered a class, a master practitioner class in Malaysia. And, and in you classical went. feng shui. Well, I, I looked and I was like, oh, I could never justify doing something like that, even though I would love to do it. Mm -hmm. And then all these things started happening, and I really started to think concretely about how I could open a shop about feng shui, and yes. how interesting would that be? And But I'd need to get things in Asia, and so I, not knowing any step of the way what I was doing, just one thing happened after another. And well, I that's really- That's inspirational, actually, you it, know? It is, ama it's pretty amazing. You I just look follow your it. dream like that. I know. And trust. Yeah, well, you know what? I've never been one to trust believe it or oh, not. Oh, you haven't. I have been a very negative thinker for most of my life. I've never trusted any gut instincts. And so mm -hmm. for all these things to happen and for me to be in flow mm -hmm. first time in my life in my mid-40s, it was really amazing wow. and a beautiful experience. And I didn't appreciate it as it was happening because it was just happening. And, I and was what like, year did you start then, the uh, shop? Yes, the, the shop opened about two years ago. Two years and ago. so about three years ago is when I went over to Asia and bought oh. my first container of merchandise and went to school to really formally study mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. it and just so, happened so quickly oh well that uh, was absolutely beautiful and I think that the people at home will be inspired by your um, spontaneity is what it is really just to allow your passion to lead you is a beautiful thing yeah, and that it, hopefully it gives people hope because I know I, for most of my career and adult life, really felt lost and felt very stuck and felt like I was always coming, like not just feeling great in what I was doing. And so for this to happen, it's very well, many possible. Many people are in the same position. Yes. They have to work at something that they may not be totally fulfilled yes. at, and yet they feel afraid to leave it because of the security of course, that yeah. it provides you. But it can happen. But it can happen, it can and happen. so you're a testament yeah. to that. Yeah. So then let's begin. Tell us then, what is feng shui? Uh, 
there seems to be a lot of confusion as to what it is exactly. So if you could just start anywhere you'd like and sure. clear it up for us a little bit. Yeah, us there's a lot of reasons it. I think why there's a lot of confusion around feng shui, oh. and I'll I'll kind of address a couple different areas. All right. One of them is that there are two large schools of feng shui. One which is classical, which is the traditional form of feng shui, and another which is modern. Mm -hmm. They're very different from each other. And so someone can say, oh, if I would like to improve the relationships in my life, how would I do that in feng shui? If you go on the internet, you will find probably 20 different ways to do it. And Using the, feng shui energy yes. to improve your relationship, you're saying? Yes. How interesting, Because right? the two schools, one, um, one is the traditional school. The main thing making it traditional meaning that they use a compass. They use a compass, a very powerful compass. Is called that the a one you have hand. here? Yes. Maybe we could show I'll that show to everybody. A, I did so bring just, it. Yes, there this it is, is. This is called a low pan. And mm -hmm. um, it is basically a very powerful compass. And mm -hmm. it's got many different formulas right on the dial. Mm -hmm. So that you can, based on the orientation of a building, be able to tell right away energetically the different patterns that are dispersing itself on the property. And so classical uses the low pin. It takes orientation into consideration and it also takes time into consideration because energy is a fluid moving thing. Over the time, time energy space moves. continuum, yes. right? We can't separate one from the other. Yes. Yes. And so what happened was there was a gentleman named Master Lin Yun. He was a feng shui grandmaster who came to Los Angeles. How do you spell his last name? Just, I'm y sure the people at home. Y-U-N. Y-U-N, all right, go yes. ahead. Yes, L-I-N-Y-U-N. <laughs> right. And he arrived in Los Angeles in 1986, and he wanted to bring feng shui to the United States, and he realized that the compass confused everybody. It made it too complicated. So what he did was he pulled the compass out, and he said, the way you can look at the energy of a property is basically orienting all your life areas around the main entrance. So that is I very I have heard different. that. Yes. Yes, that's what I have heard, the main yes. entrance being the focal point. Yes, well it is the focal point, oh. but what modern does is it doesn't assume that energy moves, so all your life areas stay in one place in that house regardless of time and regardless of orientation, it's always the exact same setup all around the front door. Now that's what I did for the 15 years that I did it as oh, a I hobby see. because it was much easier. You know, studying feng shui, you can study it for a lifetime and each year learn new things and new no, layers. Really. And I had no idea that it had, it was so, there's so multifaceted. Yes, there's so much depth and complexity really? to it and so it really is harder to get into than modern. So now you use the compass yes. and you find it superior. Well, because you get a lot more information about what's going on energetically with the home that you're living in or the office that you're working in. And classical takes into consideration our own unique energy because each of us, depending on when we were born, has different orientations that are more suitable for us. And so it takes in a lot of different things into consideration so that you get a much more detailed analysis of so how you, to use So you energy. take someone's birth chart? Well, or you just their know what their birthday birth. is. It's not even time. It's month and year. Month and year. Yes. So it's, it's less precise than astrology would be. As, yes, yeah. definitely. But based on your month and year, each of us has four very healthy compass directions and four not so healthy. And I so see. the whole goal of that one formula is to orient ourselves on axes that are very healthy and uplifting for us, energizing. It Some are very. to me what happens if your door happens to be in the wrong orientation. Well, there's things that can be done. So there these, are. there's so many can, different oh, layers good. and many different mm -hmm. fixes and many different adjustments that can mm -hmm. be made mm -hmm. to accommodate the people who are living in the house because typically you move into a house mm -hmm. and it is the way that it is and yes. most houses or many houses will even have a master suite section with a master bath it's not like you can move around so much but maybe we're skipping ahead of ourselves because oh. I think one of the things I wanted to talk about was how 
confusing feng shui can be. Yes, yes, you know? yes. We'll go and back I think to that, of course. One of the important things is not only that there are the two different schools, which are very different from each other, but then depending on if you studied with somebody, what school you studied in, how you interpreted it, how you go out into the world and practice it, they become many, it, there's not one consistent way to do it. So that's one reason why there's confusion. Another reason is that um, and I, I always, well, one thing that I always tell people about feng shui is that because of this confusion, don't believe everything you hear. You know, one of the best ways to get into feng shui, if it's meaningful for you, is to learn about it yourself. Mm -hmm. Because then you can be the best judge of whether something feels aligned with you and resonates with you or if it doesn't. And one thing I always say is if something doesn't feel right, if somebody tells you something and it doesn't feel right, don't do it. Mm -hmm. because not everyone is right. Everyone interprets things differently. And um, one of the things that I know you believe very strongly in is the power of our thinking and our thoughts. Oh, absolutely. And quantum physics is a huge part of feng shui. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I tell people is that any type of fear-based thinking that gets brought into feng shui, which it does a lot, and you know, this is only my personal and professional opinion because Everyone thinks differently about the subject, but I feel very strongly that if someone says they're a feng shui expert and they tell you, if you don't do this, this bad thing will happen to you, that's not feng shui to me because mm -hmm. I really believe, like you do, that where we focus our thinking, we have a very strong ability to create what yes. we are thinking about. What you concentrate on is what you get. Yes. You so manifest. If you're, yes. Yeah, so whatever if, that may be. Yes fearful as well yes, as hopeful. Exactly. And so it's I, I really say it's very important what you're filling your head with. So that's that's another reason. So that's that's something that I feel is very important. Um, and then another thing that I think makes yes. feng shui confusing is that a lot of people think that feng shui is a religion in and of itself. And they I think do. yes. And a lot of people have come to me saying, isn't it some kind of a religion? And I've heard that ah, there's a lot of confusion, that really? it is a religion in and of itself. It but would I have think, never occurred to me, but you know. <laughs> well, well, you know a lot yes, more about feng shui. Perhaps. <laughs> but a lot but, of people don't even know what it is. And then as yes. they get into it, they have their different ideas. Mm -hmm. But I think the reason why that might happen is because in a lot of environments that have been feng shui, you will find spiritual statuary uh, Buddhas, of Buddhas uh, and Kuan Yin. Uh, yes. But it's because a lot of times Asians are into it and where it originated, which was in China, they are Buddhist. And so Buddhists have spiritual... Um, but that isn't a component of the practice, putting statues of Buddha or just, say, a religious artifacts? Well. I think what I'm trying to say, if I'm not being clear, is that feng shui is not a religion. It can, you know, all of us have different personal goals and aspirations. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, spirituality for me at this point in my life is really important. Mm -hmm. I want to develop a stronger connection to spirit. It's important to me. So that will become part of the priorities when I feng shui my mm -hmm. property. Mm -hmm. I will make sure that the energy is aligned in such a way to support me so that I can explore that area of mm -hmm. my life and manifest what I would ultimately like to achieve in that area of my life. Mm -hmm. So it can be a part of your feng shui, spirituality, religion, whatever it is that you aspire to mm -hmm. outside of yourself. But it doesn't have to be. If you're an atheist, you can have great feng shui I'm, as well. What I'm a little confused about is uh, how then do, do you incorporate the various artifacts of your particular belief or religious structure into what is a uh, the un underpinning of that, say, let's just say science, mm -hmm. of energy? Yeah. How are those two correlated? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, in classical feng shui, there are many different formulas that you use when you analyze a person, a family living in a house, or mm -hmm. a boss or employee working in an office. Mm -hmm. One of the formulas involves symbolism, okay? And that is the part, that is a formula that really directly works with 
the quantum physics of the world, our thinking. Because the symbolism that you surround yourself with in feng shui is very important because you want to place something that means something very specific to you so that each time you look at it, you put out your best intentions about what you t want to manifest in that area of your life. So for example, using this symbolic formula in feng shui, a horse rearing on its legs, okay, is something that a lot of people will use either to really invigorate their business, to keep them competitive, to keep them sharp-minded so that the decisions that they make about their business help them to be successful. And horses like that can also be used to really help your reputation how you are perceived by others, how you are recognized for the work you do. These whether are archetypical then. For in Chinese, in China. In China. Okay, so I tell people too, this is Chinese symbolism and that's what I have in my shop. But it's if something means that to you, it can be a shoe, it can be an old shoe. Mm -hmm. If that shoe there on the table means Symbolizes that to you. Yes, something particular that's what to you. you use. Yes. yes. And so in religion, what we were just talking about, a cross can mean something to someone yes. who's Christian or Catholic. A Buddha can mean something mm -hmm. to someone who is Buddhist. So depending so on what... So what it does is it turns your thoughts, um, the symbol turns your thoughts in the direction that you want it to go. Yes. Thereby manifesting what you want to manifest. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the quantum physics of it. It is. Yeah. And so that one formula which is called Eight Life Aspiration when translated out of Chinese, mm -hmm. it looks at eight different very important aspects of your life, your career, your prosperity, your family, your health, okay? So you look at those different areas of your life and depending on the point you are in your life, you might say, okay, career is very important to me. I would like to make sure that the symbolism that I use in my home aligns me to really doing well in my career, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So you will have a very specific intention about your career. Somebody else will have a very different intention about their career, but that's the cool thing about feng shui. You align feng shui to your unique goals mm -hmm. and aspirations mm -hmm. in life. So that's one formula, the symbolic layer. Then there's the layer that actually looks at the energy of a building. Because every building, depending on when it was built, depending on the axes on which it was built, has a different energy pattern that gets distributed through the home or the building. Um, and I absolutely believe that. Yeah, yes. and it's fascinating mm -hmm. because in feng shui, depending on the orientation and depending on the disbursement of energies, there are very different unique qualities of energy that will fill that particular sector of a house. Mm -hmm. Now, it can be as specific as um, I'm going to do something positive and negative. So something as specific as a negative thing would be, oh, if you are going to be robbed in this property, it will happen at this particular sector of the so house. So it can point it out. It can point it out. Okay. And then something very positive. If you are going to make a ton of money, you're going to orient yourself in this part of the house. Because in this part of the house, it is all about a huge flow of money for you. So the goal is understanding energetically very specifically what types of energy are in different rooms of your house or office so that you can strategically put yourself in the sectors of the building that are most uplifting, most inspiring, most health and encouraging. Health encouraging and financially encouraging. Yes. So you'd only want to put your office in the area that was money oriented. I would, you would imagine. like to, yes. yes. But as we talked about just a few minutes ago, sometimes you are in a house that is built a certain way. And it you is can't. You can't make this kind it of change. It might be the kitchen. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so this is where feng shui becomes, when you have the different formulas to work with, you overlay one on top of the other. And it's this beautiful kind of melding of, here's one formula that says this about what I can do in terms of using energy to my benefit, but here's another formula that I can layer on top of it. So where one might fall shy, of what I'd like to do, I can enhance a different formula that maybe works on my own individual energy. So maybe... And I've heard also that, can you manipulate that energy through the use of mirrors? Okay, so... No, it, no I, I don't mean to jump ahead. Oh, no anything. problem. It just came to my mind. No problem. Um, different practitioners will use mirrors in different ways. Mirrors, in my practice, are an element of water. 
okay? So where you want to highly activate something, you might put a mirror, okay? If the energy is good in a particular sector of the house, and in particular, if it is a money-making energy, which is very, very impacted and stimulated by water, as is any energy, you would maybe put a mirror there. But, oh. but for example, where you would not want to put a mirror, necessarily tons of mirrors are in your bedroom because water is the most powerful activating type of energy. No, so I yes. have so many mirrors in my bedroom. Well, do you sleep well at yes. night? Yes. Okay. But that's then. because I'm... <laughs> Because you're tired? tired. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm exhausted at the end of the day. One thing I say in all my workshops is, if it ain't broke, don't, don't fix, fix it. it okay? okay, Because not everyone experiences what you may traditionally experience oh. in a bedroom full of mirrors. Yes. Okay, And like we were saying, water, which is an element, what you were talking about, one of the mm -hmm. five elements mm -hmm. in feng shui, that's one aspect of feng shui. You, and depending on your orientation of the direction your head is facing when mm -hmm. you're sleeping has so much to do with the quality of your sleep. And could you clarify that for us, yeah. please? Because I've heard that if your head is oriented in a particular direction, you are uh, less likely to be able to fall asleep than mm -hmm. if it's oriented in another. Yes. Which directions are those? Okay. So what we briefly talked about before, one of the formulas is where I look at somebody's birth month and birth year. Mm -hmm. Depending on that birth month and birth year, we each get four very good, healthy directions and four not so good directions. Oh, so it's individual. It is, it's but it's a formula. So oh. once you know what your birth month and birth year is, you are assigned something called a guan number. So everyone with that guan number has the same four healthy directions and the same four unhealthy directions. I understand. But there are nine different guan numbers, okay? Oh. So depending on which of the nine you to are. to numerology almost. It's kind of, yeah. Because well, there feng are nine shui, numbers there. Yes, yeah. feng shui is highly based on numbers. And as I've gotten into this and learning so many different mm -hmm. things about numbers and how they... Um, form very specific patterns in the world and how numbers are so heavily used in feng shui even though it's very formulaic it, it's very um what's the word for it you can depend on what's going to happen depending on where these numbers are showing up okay. so anyway so with the birthday yes okay once you are given a guan number and you know what your four healthy directions are and your four unhealthy directions you always want to make sure that your head is facing one of your healthy directions for sleep. And there is one particular direction that is particularly good for sleep and health. So if you can, you want to orient your head to be facing that direction. But it's different for different people. For different for different people. And one of the fun things that happens a lot is when couples, okay, who have different guan numbers, sometimes my healthy direction will be my husband's most unhealthy direction. So oh. what do you do then? Okay. So there's all these tweaks that you can do. Sometimes it's what as do simple, you do? Okay. Sometimes it's as simple as shifting the person's position a little bit in the bed so that their head then actually faces a good direction for them. Hopefully that's the solution that you can make. In a king size bed? <laughs> And hopefully your bed is big enough that you can do it. That would be um, difficult. But like I said, there's all these tweaks that you make, uh -huh. okay? And it's a balancing act, well, just like you're balancing your energy. Time for the return of the, of the twin beds, you know, for <laughs> <Yes. couples. laughs> One facing that way and, and the, the other. other <laughs> different bedrooms even. <laughs> well, I mean, that brings us to another thing that, because we're kind of going free for all here, uh, but... Well, it's just such an interesting subject, it it's hard to keep it in categories. You had mentioned before, oh, if the front door is not located in a good area yes. for someone, what do you do? So one of the formulas, which we're just talking about, the orientation of us as individuals, one of the, th one of the very powerful aspects of that formula is your main door and the way that it faces, because each time you pass through that door, you are traveling along that axis. And so you want that axis to be a healthy one for you. 
Okay. Most particularly because you always use it. Yes. Yeah. And so you are constantly passing through that uh -huh. energy uh -huh. on a regular basis and you want that to be healthy and uplifting for you. So just like energy can be help, just like somebody's energy, you can be with someone and they make you feel great, you yes. know, for no reason. Sometimes they don't even have yes. to be saying something. The way they smile, their energy affects you in a beautiful way. You can be with somebody else. Sorry, mosquito. <laughs> you can be with somebody else and they drain you and you don't feel good yes. after you've been with them and yes. you feel tired and it's like enervated. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So that is is also a very kind of similar thing to the axes, okay? Mm -hmm. That energy can uplift you or it can drain you. So yes. you want to always orient yourself on something that feels good. So sometimes that facing direction is not good for the person who lives there. Okay. Then when you take into consideration a couple and then a family, oh dear, with all different numbers, you're really looking well, how, at... Well, what solutions can well, you... Well, see, this is where you yes. have to balance again. You look at everyone in the family. Like, let's say it's a husband and a wife and three children. You want to first look at who are the most important contributors to that family, which are typically the mother and the father. So you want to make sure that because they're taking care of the children and they're in positions where they need to either be bringing home enough money, caring for the children well, that they feel good first. Okay. Yes. So you want to make sure that the entrances are oriented in a way that are good for them. Then when you look at the husband and wife, they may not have the same orientation that's good for them because their, one, the husband's four healthy directions may not be the same as the wife's four healthy directions. So a lot of times, one door, the front door, might be good for the husband. And then the door that you come in through the garage might be good for the wife. So when it works out like that, the husband mainly uses the front door so that he's constantly energized. And the wife uses the door from the garage or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So you make those kind of tweaks. Now, where none of the doors are facing a good direction for either of the parents, you can actually do this trick that I learned from second generation feng shui masters in Australia. You actually can get a carpenter to come and reframe a door or a couple of doors so that the door shifts so that when you build out the frame a little bit, the actual door then, when you pass through it, is shifted a little bit no. to accommodate one of your good directions so that each time you pass in and out so they build it, it out forces and you to angle be, it. Yes, exactly. I see. And I've done that in my store because although the door that I enter is a very good sector of the building, it was not facing exactly the right way. So I had a carpenter come in and shift that door for me oh, to ensure that I'm constantly going in and out on an axis that is invigorating and healthy for me. Oh, I work a lot. So oh, yes, sure. you're always in there. <laughs> so anyway, that's one of the formulas. It's taking into consideration how you do. And so like when you're in an office, when you're at your desk, you want to make sure you're facing a very good uplifting energy. One of the directions is what they call your Shang Chi, which is the most energizing, powerful direction. So when you work, you want to be facing that direction if okay. you can. Whereas for sleep, that's a different direction. That's a more gentle, healthy energy. You want less will, energy. Exactly. Yes. But still very healthy for you mm -hmm. and very soothing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's now, fascinating like that. I don't know if it's feng shui or not, mm -hmm. but I know that in uh, Chinese philosophy, the painting of the red door is important to bring um, abundance into the house. Yes. Does that have anything to do f with feng shui? It does, but it's not exactly correct. Okay. Oh. I had also heard many years ago that you should paint your door red because then the good energy will find your house. Yes. And people can find your house. But that's actually not correct because, and one thing we didn't talk about is why feng shui works. Okay. Feng shui works because we are all energy. Every single thing in our universe, this universe. Well, on that's Earth. why it's so persuasive. Yes. Because it's it's uh, self-evident that everything is energy, and that yes. to understand the the actual um, flow of energy and what energy is doing can be extremely uh, helpful yes, in living exactly in a right. harmonious environment. 
not only harmonious, but one that you can use as a literal launching pad yeah. for your life. An one, impetus. Yes. Energy impetus. Yes. And yeah. one that will really help to give you much better chance of succeeding in your life mm -hmm. than if you don't understand energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the reason why I bring this up, that we are all energy, is that color is energy. Of course okay? Of course. The color red is a fire energy. Mm -hmm. So you're going to want to use red where there is a fire sector in your home that is a good sector. Okay? So it's, it, this is meaning, why. Meaning that it's a sector in which you want high energy. Well, is so, that what you're saying? No. no. So I'll just show you. I don't know if, and if this is even helpful to look at. But All right. This is actually sure. a floor plan okay. of one floor of a building. Each of these rooms has contained a certain energy in that room. Okay. Okay. Each of those energies is one element or another of the five. And then, depending on the type of energy in the room, it's either going to be a healthy energy or an unhealthy energy. Okay. So once you understand that, the element that dominates that sector and whether, because that element, a fire element room can be very invigorating in a healthy way, but it can also be very draining in an unhealthy way. So mm -hmm. just because it's fire doesn't mean it's one way or the other. It can be either. So if you find a room that is a fire element room, but it's in an unhealthy sector of the building, you're not going to want to put red in there because that's going to make it even stronger. It. You right. don't want to emphasize right. it. Right. But if you emphasize it, yes, right? you want to balance it. With so you'd paint it element. blue or green. Well, you could. That's water. Blue is a water mm -hmm. element. Yes. Okay. In terms of a color. So every element, fire, water, wood, all has colors associated yes. with it. So you use color as well as shape as well as the element itself to balance things. Literally putting wood into it or exactly. flowing water. Like exactly. A, now if you put a wood, if you put a piece of wood mm -hmm. in a fire element room where it's good, you're going to make that stronger because fire is going to burn the wood. Okay. I see. But if you put water in a, so this is, this is where I hope I'm not getting no, too no, into no, this. It's, no, this I like, I like this there. because okay. it's, it, it makes it more real. Okay. So in the element world, which is a huge part of what you use in feng shui mm -hmm. to balance the energy that you are surrounded mm -hmm. by, you use that whole element cycle. There is a productive cycle in terms of, for example, water feeds wood, okay? But water, okay, wood, so there's that, that's the productive cycle. The destructive cycle is what you brought up before. Water puts out fire. Okay? That's the destructive cycle. So you would cycle. not want to put it in a fire room if you wanted more the fire, the fire exactly. to be there. But in feng shui, you also don't want to extinguish any element because you need all the elements to be balanced. So there's something called, um, so that the destructive cycle is something that we don't use. What we use is a cycle that is going to suppress the energy and not extinguish it altogether. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's a whole melding of all these energies. And so... It's quite subtle and, and, and you could get really quite complicated, you know, as to how you could use the energy of any particular room and how you could manipulate it. Yes, you're exactly right. How interesting. Right. You're exactly right. And I still, when I do my consultations, I always refer to my books. You know, because like I said, it takes many, many years to get really, really good at this to the point where you can just, there are, there are master feng shui people who as consultants can just go into a building, not write a single thing down, not look at a single book. Intuitively. Well, it's that they've sort of studied that, it, yes, but it's just so ingrained in them because they've been doing it for so many years. So they understand so it they, so yeah, well. And so they can just tell you right then and there. Oh, yes. And I'm at a completely different level. I need to still look at my books and look at my charts and really make sure that I've got all my bases and covered. And how would someone who's just beginning themselves um, you would, would you recommend that they launch themselves so completely in it, or they just yeah, start a tweaking question. a little bit yeah, here and there? It's a great question. Um, how you get into feng shui, I think the best way to start is to, to read some books. Okay, Like we talked about in the very beginning, there's two different schools. 
the modern school and the classical school. The classical school is much more complicated to dive right into. So you might want to start with modern. That way it kind of, you start to kind of start to understand the framework of it. Like on a, a philosophy. Level. Yes. Yes. And then if you like it, and, and not only that, there's so many different authors out there. So you can go onto Amazon or whatever and kind of look through the table of contents, read it for a few pages get something that you feel like, oh, this is interesting to me, okay? Then if you like what you're reading and you want to take it to another level, let's say you've mastered the modern version and you want to get into a more detail-oriented detail -oriented version of it, you can then start looking into classical. Classical is definitely more complicated. So after you've read some things about classical feng shui and you've got yourself oriented, I would say take a workshop. Take a workshop. Okay. Yes, because yeah. that will introduce you to it on another level. Get another layer of it. And then if that really interests you and you really want to take it to another level yourself, you would go and study with somebody. And I would recommend that you study with someone who has a very strong reputation, who's credible, who has experience, because there's a lot there, of different it's people. It's very much there. like in the yoga world as well. There are a myriad of uh, schools and teachers now, of so many that it's almost impossible to, to uh, sort it out. Yes. And it can be actually detrimental You're right. uh, to, to study from particular schools or particular people. Even. You're right. And so ultimately, the onus is on us to do our research, to do our homework, yeah. and to really be sure of before we make an investment like that, that we're going with something that is going to be good for us, okay? Now, I'm thinking that, say, um, if somebody were to, to just have bought a business and or a house, mm -hmm. this would be the most appropriate time for them to um, learn about feng shui or perhaps to even consult someone like yourself to bring yes. them in at that point. Yeah, you're right. Before they've already made all the the uh, adjustments, painted the walls, mm -hmm. put their things where they are and arranged it the way they wanted to, it would behoove them before then mm -hmm. to consult someone like you, right? Definitely. Right. So most ideally, if you and most people don't have this ability to build something from scratch, okay, ideally you would build something from scratch and very strategically orient the front door. Oh, wouldn't that be the ideal? The rooms. That's the most perfect way to do it, okay? Yes. Because that would be the most perfect. Most people, though, buy a house that already exists. That would also be a great time because, well, actually, before you buy the house, because you want to make sure that the bedrooms where everyone's going to be sleeping, where you spend an inordinate amount of time, ha almost half your half life. Half your life, yes. You want to make sure that depending on the orientation of that building, that those bedrooms are in good, healthy parts of the house. Mm -hmm. And you want to do that before you buy the house because you can't change that. You can't yeah. change the energy in a property because it... Sh so when we were talking about before how classical feng shui takes into consideration time and that energy is constantly moving. Mm -hmm. Energy moves from second to second, minute to minute. But in feng shui, what you do is you align your home or your office for a period. Each period lasts for 20 years. We're in the period of eight, which ends in 2024. So if you're going to buy a house now, you're going to orient everything according to all the energy and all the energy patterns that are found in this eighth period. When 2024 hits, it's a completely no different kidding. shift. Completely so then it really takes different. into to consideration even our cosmic movement yes because that's what it is exactly. we're moving cosmically through exactly. space exactly exactly right? yes and it's very meaningful it makes sense mm -hmm. um, and then once you get everything oriented for the 20 years you're going to look at the energy each year because you could drive yourself crazy with this if mm -hmm. you were to try and do even monthly I mean I know people who look at it monthly and that's just a lot what I do at a monthly level is once in a while I'll be like, wow, things feel so off. Let me see what's going on this month. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, but you're going to orient yourself to the 20-year period, and then each year you want to do a few tweaks around what's going on energetically for that year. Mm -hmm. But my point of all of this is that for that 20-year period through 2024, there's very little that you can do about the base energy plan of your house. So before you buy a house, 
you will bring somebody or you will take a compass measurement yourself on the facing direction of that front door and you're going to be able to tell right away. You get the floor plan, you look and you see what's going on. And you want to make sure that the bedroom, all the places where your family is going to spend the most time are good. That's and very interesting. And each house is different. And not every house has the same type of energy that every other house has. Each oh, I one can attest unique, to that. Yes. It's very unique. And it's interesting. I mean, if we, if we just skip over to um, numerology again, mm -hmm. I've, when you add the numbers of your house together and you get the, the, um, the number, mm -hmm. the final number, mm -hmm. each number has a different quality. To it, yes. and it's interesting in retrospect when I go back and remember how I was in each house that I've, I've lived in, mm -hmm. and I uh, see the number. The correlation is almost absolutely always this, the perfect. Yeah. It describes exactly how that house felt and was. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's, um, but it must be. It must be the same sort of thing. It is because, okay, so depending on the practitioner, certain practitioners are really into numbers. Mm -hmm. The people who I studied with in Australia, who are originally from Malaysia, when I told them about my business, because they happened to be in the same class that I was in, because they, oh. they became part of the Lillian II franchise. She has a huge multi, multi-million dollar business called the World of Feng Shui. Anyway. Even so though they you had... kept in touch with the people that you studied oh, with? Oh, yeah. Oh. But these two people in particular, they had many, many years of experience, but they had to take the Master Practitioner course under Lillian in order to open the franchise. That's probably way too much detail for this, but no, no, anyway. No, that's interesting. <laughs> no. um, they're very into numerology, and so when I told them the address of my store, 2135, 21. 35, I have to do this, adds up yes. to 8, <laughs> nine, No one 10, can count 11, anymore, two. don't worry. <laughs> but they were saying the number 4 is a much better number for a store. Yes, I can see that. Grounded so, and practical. And well, see, your definitions will probably be slightly different, different from, from the feng shui ones. Yeah. But, oh, I see. Um, but if they were like saying, if you add N-O, meaning number, in not U.S., I mean the United States, no one uses N-O for number 2135 yeah. as an address, but like in Europe, they'll use it. They're like, if you do that, that adds numbers onto this because each letter in the yeah, alphabet. Has, a, has its corresponding yeah. number. I don't really do that. However, one thing I know for sure is that the number eight in the eighth period is a very powerful number. Yes. The number eight also on its side is the infinity symbol, Absolutely. which is a very powerful symbol no matter what. And eight is the, the, the money uh, symbol. That is the, the, the one that uh, is about abundance, bringing in abundance. Well, and it makes you very um, focused, able to focus in on it. Mm -hmm. And a house, they say, that is an eight is also, is very difficult to live with more than one person in it. Interestingly Interesting. enough. See, and what's so fascinating is your study of numbers is clearly very different from mine. Mm -hmm. Eights in the period of eight, wherever they show up on your energetic plan, mm -hmm. that is where incredible prosperity and incredible yes. health can mm -hmm. be attained. So well, you, that's similar. That's that is a, similar. That's absolutely similar. That's similar, no, but that's like the I living meant. in the same house thing. Well, like, it's, it's the eights house, are, they say, is conducive to the energy of a single person as to opposed to a family mm -hmm. but that's all it's saying it's okay. not that it, you can't okay but that it, you do much better when there when there's only one person living in it yeah i don't know if that's true or not but i was the only one in there and i <laughs> felt very good yeah. <laughs> so, well, so it's all so interesting it's, yes it's so interesting that a number can have so much significance <laughs> now if someone were to get a feng shui consultation, what would it entail? Okay, so it would first entail a discussion, mm -hmm. just in terms of what the people are experiencing, why they want to feng shui their property or their business, um, just a little bit of background in terms of what their ultimate goals are. Then it would entail taking measurements, taking compass measurements of the building, the orientation of it, okay. getting the people's birthdays, Okay, so that, that way we can start implementing all these formulas. Then what's very important is a floor plan, a, a very exact floor plan. The of floor that plan yes, that they the give house. you. Yes. I see. Because that is what you build your whole energetic mm -hmm, map mm -hmm, on, mm -hmm. and depending on how the rooms are divided, etc. Um, 
And then I also take photos of every single room in the house, everything around the house. You do a Google kind of pan out using Google Earth to see what is surrounding the building, water, trees, things that you may not necessarily be able to see from the ground. And then you get to work and you start applying all these formulas and you start to really analyze what's going on with the building, what's going on with the people, are they aligned correctly in their building, what's going on with them, is the energy of certain rooms affecting them in a good way, in a bad way, how is the best way that they can be set up based on what they told me they want in their life. And that's how it goes. And you del I del I different consultants do something different, but sometimes they do it right on the spot. I deliver well, that's anywhere very from interesting. A very interesting. And it seems so enormously much more um, of an enterprise than I thought it would be. I thought that when someone came in, they did it more intuitively, mm -hmm. but it seems it's like this is a true scientific. science. It truly is. This and is that's why I can science. do it, because yes. I've never considered myself <laughs> an intuitive. <laughs> yes. So what, what are your future plans for your business, the, the Feng Shui Sarasota? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm so excited about what's happening and it's happening quite organically, just based on what I have to learn to run the store, to run the business. But the next phase, now that it's been focused on energy outside of us, the energy that surrounds us, it's very much getting focused now with how we balance the energy inside of us. I see. And so I just launched a new workshop, which is all about how do we feed our energetic body to be healthy so that we can respond to the positive energy that surrounds ah, us. Ah. And it's all through indulging our own senses, okay? And there's the five traditional senses and then there's the sixth sense that's very sensitive to energy and to touch. And so it's a combination of using color, essential oils, crystals, music, all to um, basically give us enjoyment and through our enjoyment gain a lot of health, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. So it's I, tying everything together uh, and it's becoming a lot and of fun. Why don't you give um, out your, uh, how they can reach you, either oh, you, okay, if you'd great. like, the yeah, phone that'd number, be wonderful. Yeah, anything well, you'd like. I have a website. Mm -hmm. It's www.fengshuisarasota.com mm -hmm. with dashes between each word. Okay. F E N G dash S H U I dash Sarasota. Okay. And um, I, my address is 2135 Siesta Drive. And if you just type in Feng Shui Sarasota on the you'll internet, it, you'll, right. you'll find me. <laughs> so. uh, you, you can give your phone number, too, if you'd okay. like. Okay. Yeah. It's, um, the store number is 941-366-8113. And I so welcome anybody who just wants to ask some questions, who's just getting into yeah. it to come in. Yeah. We just want to see what's in the shop because yeah, there's all what's kinds in the of shop. gifts and things in there. There are. Yeah. Everything means something that's yeah. special in someone's life. It's a beautiful life, so. shop, by the thank way. You really so pretty. Much. Thank pretty. you. And thank I want to you. thank you very much for coming on. Thank you so thank much you for so having much. me. It was so informative. Really, I appreciate Thanks. it. Thank you. And for those at home, um, please don't miss some of the other wonderful programming that we have here available at sbnvideo.tv. And until next week, I want to thank you for tuning in and stepping outside of the box with... Uh, us here at Beyond the Matrix, and peace and love be with you all. Until next week, thank you.